Welcome, everyone. We're going to give it another moment just to allow others to join and get connected, and then we'll get started. All right, for sake of time, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. If you experience any te technical issues, please submit those into the chat to myself, Cameron Johnson, so that I can address those for you. Uh, please feel free to use the chat to uh, converse and ask questions if needed. Uh, so with that being said, I'm gonna hand things over to Jay Feldman so we can get started. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, welcome to our webinar today. So you are all here to talk about and think about increasing reading achievement, and we're going to talk about using system measures to help spur improvement. Um, so as you're settling in, you can see we have a couple of things to ask you to do. If you could rename yourself um, to reflect your preferred name and pronouns, that would be great. And if you could share in chat a title of one of your favorite books growing up, um, one that does kind of spark the joy of learning in you, of reading in you, um, it would be really great to, to see those. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to start a conversation about reading is to um, bring back those memories of childhood. Um, before we begin, I kind of, I just want to acknowledge or, or know, like we, we at RTI have many colleagues and friends who are in North Carolina who are being impacted by the hurricane. So um, you all may as well. So I just wanted to thank you for being able to make the time and, and be with us today and learn with us today. And, um, you know, our, our thoughts and our hopes are, are with our colleagues and, and with the other folks impacted by the hurricane. So some good books there. The Magic Treehouse, my son loved those. Awesome. The Oz books, Alice in Wonderland, Beverly Clearly, Wrinkle in Time. Well, Wrinkle in Time. <laughs> Wrinkle in Time. Thank you. That one blew my mind as a fourth grader. It's like, yeah. What's going on? I forgot about um, that. <laughs> So thanks. Okay. Um, well, that's good. That's a good little start. So um, before we dive into all the work, we just wanted to kind of set some context for you. So um, on the next slide, gives you a little background about, um, about the project that we were all a part of, or many of us were a part of, and that we're sharing from. So um, a lot of the learnings from today come from uh, Bill and Melinda Gates um, um, funded project that involved 10 charter management organizations that came together with a variety of partners to systematically improve educational experiences and outcomes for students with disabilities. Um, and they did so through a networked improvement community model. Um, the, there were, uh, I just wanna kind of acknowledge a number of the folks involved. So Marshall Street Initiatives um, really led the TA aspect of the work and um, they have a website that we'll, we link to, I'll show you on the next slide, so that you would be able to find their learnings about the specific practices that many of the CMOs try implemented. Um, and then the research organizations were, were the R team, they were led by RTI, they included NERN, the National Implementation Research Network out of UNC, um, as well as SRI. And the RTI team is going to be talking with you today, as well as a couple of the um, organizations that also provided TA under Marshall Street, so Datability and um, Sparks Consulting. Um, so you hear from them on the on the panel, and we're really excited to have them here to be able to share with you all. Um, so in the next slide is the, this is just, we're going to send you the slides. Anybody who registered will get the slides. So you'll have this information and you'll you'll be able to access our website and the Marshall Street website. So the learnings that we um, have documented, we've written some reports, um, some very short reports, briefs, um, and also have some really um, powerful videos to go along with those. And um, 
they're captured on the, the Centering Students with Disabilities Hub.org page. So again, we'll we'll be able to share that out with you um, at the end of the webinar. Um, and then before we begin and I kick it off to what today's webinar is going to focus on, I just wanted to let you all know that we have a third webinar scheduled, and that's oct October 24th um, of the of this month, right? Because it's October. So that webinar is really thinking about um, building integrated systems that center diverse learners. And the example we're going to be talking about specifically about how to do that is through establishing a, a system and culture of co-teaching. And we'll have some other partners, again, with, that were part of this project with us to um, share their experiences and their learnings with you all. Okay. Um, as we go through, as Cameron said, if you have questions, pop them in the chat. And I think without further ado, we'll kick it off to, um, to the team. <laughs> to, to dive in after you, Sophia. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, so in our short, short, ever so short time together, it always goes by fast. Um, we're hoping to spend a little bit of time with you, um, understanding just some of the very basics about how to build a system of measures or a system of reading assessments um, and, and what they're for, what we might need them for. We'll be thinking about some key actions leaders can take to support effective implementation of a systems of measures. Um, in particular, we'll have one tool and some things for you to think about, as well as listening to the stories behind um, the actions and, and really hard work of our panelists in their settings. And then um, between all of us, we'll have a few resources to share with you so that we can support better um, use of assessment measures for literacy. So next slide, please. In the last webinar, um, we were talking about ways that leaders are very critical for creating systemic change. What is the role of the leader and leadership teams to be able to affect change? So as we listen today to the work of literacy assessments, determining what they are and what you need, consider a few things as leaders. Particularly, how are we, how are you listening for in this webinar, the things that leaders need to pay attention to or measure or support on a regular basis to ensure literacy assessments are done well? What stories are you hearing about how leaders might react to different obstacles or critical issues and per persevere through ups and downs when it comes to literacy and literacy assessments? How are they allocating resources and supporting efforts? What are ways in which leaders, whether they're coaches, members of teams, colleagues, modeling, teaching, coaching around literacy and literacy assessments? How do we recognize and appreciate the good work our colleagues are doing to get literacy um, resources in place? And then how are we selecting, recruiting, and promoting staff that can support assessments? So I hope you'll join me through this next sections and get some great ideas for how leaders can do so. <laughs> hey, thank you, Sophia. <laughs> Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Robin Wisniewski, and I'll be taking us through this section of introducing us to, well, I don't really have to introduce us to reading, but I will, and assessment. So, of course, this webinar is about increasing reading achievement using system measures to spur improvement. But before we get to system measures, before we start talking about assessments, we need to get grounded in reading. So let's just review to get a clear picture of these five reading elements. And I know all of you know them, um, but to get a clear picture of where our students are in their journey to, journey to becoming skilled readers. So many of you are familiar with these from the National Reading Panel's report in 2000. The National Institutes of Health con convened the panel in 1997, and over three years, they reviewed decades of research and came to consensus on these essential components of effective reading. And these five are now well known to researchers and practitioners and, of course, reading program and assessment publishers, policymakers, and educators. And it's not just knowing that these, comp uh, just not just knowing these components, because they 
can look pretty simple, just looking at phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Uh, reading programs are considered scientifically based when they teach these elements explicitly, systematically, integrated with each other and with fidelity. So I want to stay on this slide just for a little bit and to take a couple of moments here so I can share an example of explicit and, exam and an example of systematic instruction. Sometimes we get confused and if we're not used to teaching reading or if it has been a while, um, it can really help us to get into the complexity of these elements. So I'm, I'll just point out phonemic awareness. So phonemic awareness is the smallest unit of sound. A basic example is the sounds in the word cat. Those sounds are in the word cat are k at in the word cat. If I were to teach you the sounds in the word cat explicitly, I would say, well, first I would explain it. So I would say, we're going to count the sounds in the word. And then I would model. So listen, cat, k, at. Then if I had blocks in front of me, I'm gonna move one block for each sound. So I move one block, at, so I'm moving one block for each sound. And then I touch and count each block. One, two, three, there are three sounds in the word. And I would repeat the sounds and touch one block for each word. Then, and this is I do, we do, you do, the teacher and students practice the task together. So again, this is explicit instruction. So I'd say, now say the words or the, say the sounds with me and move one block for each sound. So k, at, I would say to you, say it again, touch one block for each sound. So you would touch the block with me, count the blocks. How many sounds are in this word? Yes, there are three sounds in this word. So that's the we do. And then the student practices the task. So I would say your turn, say the word, move one block for each sound. You would move one block at for each sound, you would touch, count the blocks. And I would say, yes, there are three sounds in this word. So, and then independent practice. So that explicit teaching is that I do, we do, you do. And then there's different suggestions for scaffolding for errors and adaptations to routine. So I'll keep with this phonemic awareness example now just to talk about systematic instruction. So it has to be explicit and it has to be systematic. So I, I won't go through both for each, all five because phonemic awareness and phonics are typically pretty challenging when students start to advance in the early grades. And if they're still behind in reading, a lot of times it's that phonemic awareness and phonics. And each of those are can be confusing for adults who aren't trained in reading as well. So systematic for phonemic awareness. This is systematic as as we know, grade level progressions. That's another way to think of systematic. Systematic is about small steps in a progression. So phoneme isolation. So tell me the first sound in cat. And the answer is k. phoneme identity. So I'm being systematic from sound to identifying the phoneme. Tell me the sound that's the same as, as at the beginning of dad, dog, dip, and you'd say d. Phoneme categorization, which word does not belong in the following set of words? Ran, race, sat, rock. All of those start with R instead of, uh, 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 instead of sat. So sat doesn't fit. So it's categorizing, phoneme categorization. Phoneme blending. If you put the sounds k at together, what word do they make? So it's phoneme blending. So I keep moving up systematically. Uh, the most complex is that phoneme manipulation. So what is small without the S? Mall. What is mall with the S at the beginning? Small. What is mall with T instead of, or what is mall with T instead of M? Mm, tall. So moving from phonemic awareness to phonics, 
Phonemic awareness is letter sound awareness. It's a subset of phonological awareness. Phonological awareness includes the phonemes, it includes syllables, onset sounds to words, rhymes of words. And moving to phonics, notice I didn't show you any letters. This was, phonemic awareness is all about sounds. That's the first thing reading teachers learn is that difference between phonemic awareness and phonics. So I didn't show any letters. Um, and then moving to phonics, uh, an example here is it's moving to letter sound relationships. So the most common rhymes in phonics, like the at rhyme is very common. Ack, like at, cat, bat, sat, ack, back, rack, <laughs> tack, an, ban, can, ham. So we start to see the words and the letter sound relationships and actually see the letters in phonics. Fluency is reading with automaticity and prosody. So prosody is expression when oral reading, and it sounds like speech. So as we read in phrases leading to comprehension, so it's that phrasing. And then vocabulary is the knowledge of words and word meanings like um, uh, word meanings and like, like VOC, that uh, um, a, 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 that root word, a Latin root word, VOC, uh, means word or name like advocacy, convocation, uh, vocal, vowel. So it's understanding words, their meaning, their context, and then comprehension, extracting and constructing meaning from words and texts. So uh, example strategies, we're getting into pre-reading, during reading, after reading strategies, questioning, using graphic organizers. So here we have the five reading elements. They have to be taught explicitly, systematically, integrated with each other, uh, with fidelity. Let's jump to the next slide, which is the reading rope. And it shows the complexity. So the National Reading Panel's five components that we just saw could be simplified by too many practitioners. But when we start to understand the systematic, the explicit, and teaching them and how they rope together, this reading rope, of course, is another way to see it. Um, as I talked through them, you can see how they were integrated. Uh, but And then Scarborough uh, created this reading rope about the same time as we learned about the five components. Those five components are integrated here with uh, as you see on top, that, that's mostly phonemic awareness, biological awareness, phonics in the yellow, red, and orange. As those skills on top get better, students become more automatic with word recognition. So it's really the automaticity of reading is coming on top, those uh, red, yellow, orange colors in the ropes. That's the automaticity and as students become uh, better on the way to becoming skilled readers. And you see those colors on the bottom, the blue and the green, that's about the fluency, vocabulary and comprehension. And students become more strategic as they comprehend language. So it's that language comprehension to become skilled readers. So these two really help us in understanding what those reading skills are. And I want you to think about well, I know these reading skills. How am I assessing them? So this is where I'm going to ask you, and we'll move to the next slide. How do you assess these reading skills? So this question is for all of you to answer in, this, in the chat. Notice on this slide are the five components of uh, reading on the left, the National Reading Panel, and the reading rope. What reading assessments do you use in your school or district to assess these skills? So just take a few moments to add reading assessments and what they're used for in the chat. And while you're adding, I see Woodcock Johnson, while you're adding, uh, maybe I'll talk about some. So you might mention iReady and MAP tests for annual summative assessments of reading or Dibbles for universal screening and progress monitoring or a cadence reading. I see, yep, star is one, star reading, M class, I ready. So we're already seeing some 
that are can be classified differently in the chat, some that are diagnostic, some that can be used as screeners. Um, typical tests like the Woodcock-Johnson or the Wechsler Individual Achievement Test, those identify areas of reading needs, so they're more diagnostic. Okay, and some question and answer tests. So there's also formative assessments used in the classroom for a question and answer, question and answer uh, on diagnostics that can help with word recognition and for comprehension. Any other tests that you're using and for what? As you're thinking of those, just go ahead and add them to the chat and we'll move to the next slide. And I'll talk briefly here through this overview of assessments. And I'm gonna highlight just one type of assessment before Sophia takes over to discuss how to map these reading measures in your system. Uh, and then after that, we'll have our panel. So seeing this table, different states use different terms. So in the first column, it says interim assessments, which are used for screening and progress monitoring. Screening and progress monitoring assessments are often the same tool, just for different purposes. So I'm seeing um, Dibbles uh, and M-Class, um, and then STAR reading the uh, screener and STAR, the screener and iReady, um, just lo looking at the chat. Those all can be used for screening and progress monitoring. And they're the same tool for different purposes. So universal screeners are administered one to three times a year to a class grade or the entire school. And the purpose is to identify students at risk for reading difficulties and determine who may need additional reading support. Whereas progress monitoring uh, can be given weekly or biweekly or monthly. It's based on the intensity of support the student is getting and used for, used during the instruction and intervention to measure progress. The most common interim assessments are the oral reading fluency measures. And uh, before Sophia takes over, I'm gonna just talk about those a minute. Uh, but those are the most commonly used um, interim assessments. The oral reading fluency measures or ORF, the acronym or measuring words a student reads per minute. So I'll talk about those in a moment. So the interim assessments, they don't inform what a student needs. It just says, they just inform what, uh, that, that students have needs, who has needs, and, and how they're doing during the intervention for progress monitoring. The diagnostic assessments, that those assessments assess student needs. These assessments pinpoint specific strengths and weaknesses in reading skills, such as phonics or vocabulary, and really provide that uh, detailed profile to guide targeted interventions. And summative assessments, well, of course, they're a summary. So they're assessments administered at the end of the year to evaluate whether students have learned what was taught. So next, uh, last slide before, we get to hear Sophia's voice again, uh, is a, a focus in on the interim assessments. Again, the interim assessments are to identify students who have needs, so who those students are who might be at risk or below grade level already and who have needs and to monitor the progress. So on the screen, you see norms and they're typical norms for interim assessments. Um, and, and of oral reading fluency or ORF as the acronym. It's called oral reading fluency, but remember, we always have to remember this, fluency is automaticity plus prosody. We saw that earlier when we were looking at the five elements. So oral reading fluency or ORF is, it doesn't test real fluency, it's testing automaticity which is another way that we can tell that these tests are diagnosed, that, um, that, that we can test that these tests are just more of a, a temperature check, a thermometer. It's just testing words per minute, not fluency. They're not a diagnostic. So let me just explain briefly. So since the 1980s, the ORF subtest has grown in the research as this temperature check, like a thermometer. It's used to find those students who are at risk for reading difficulties to monitor them just like a thermometer will measure a human temperature 
to show how we're at risk or having an issue. So if our temperature is 100, um, we then test for this issue using a diagnostic so when we find that particular virus, then we take medication for the virus, like a reading diagnostic, find tonic comprehension, and the intervention matches it. So we administer a medication or the intervention, then use the thermometer or the ORF to progress monitor. So we see the temperature goes down. So if, if you look at this, and this is the last thing I'll say about this slide, say we test a second grader at the beginning of the year and find they score a 23. And so they're in the 10th percentile. And then we administer a diagnostic, we match that to intervention, and then we use this ORF again, progress monitor mid-year, and oh, they're reading 40 words per minute. So now they're just above the 10th percentile. That's when we see growth and we start plotting uh, on a graph, our progress monitoring. So uh, Sophia will actually start with this idea uh, I'll turn it over for to her for system mapping. You'll see she'll start with how universal screeners give us that picture of overall health. Right. Thank you, Robin. So part of my role often is helping teachers and literacy leaders really understand how this works. And some of my favorite ways to do that are to give a metaphor of some kind. So as many things in education, I'm using, um, in this case, a medical metaphor, um, Lately, I've been super interested in longevity hacks, so this metaphor is even more relevant lately as we learn more about what it takes to live longer and live better. So as we think about assessments and literacy, one of the things I like to tell my teachers is think of it like this. Your universal screeners in literacy tell us about our overall health of our curriculum and how well our students are doing just like for ourselves. There are universal screeners that we get and use to, to determine our overall health, whether it's blood pressure or weight or BMI or a blood panel, right? All of these things just give us an indication of our overall health. They might also point to or indicate ways that, um, or areas, right, that, that might flag for us that this could be an area of concern and we need to, and we need to dig a little deeper. In which case, we might use something like a diagnostic assessment, where we might get a specific test that will give us indications if there's something else we need to attend to, and if so, what that might be. In that case, then we would make a plan, right? An overall health plan or goal, or in our case, a literacy plan. And in doing so, then we might periodically take, as Robin mentioned, formative assessments, they might tell us where, where we're doing well, what we might need to continue to work on, um, how we are we progressing in our plan, how are we progressing in our skills. And then eventually, hopefully, I might be given some type of benchmark. Where am I progressing on my way towards my health goals or to my overall health and wellness? Where, do I, where am I positioned in what's ideal for my age, my weight, my health span, my lifespan, right? So how does that help me understand or get that information? And then eventually a summative assessment. Have I met my goals? And if not, why not? So sometimes providing that type of metaphor helps teachers better ground in not just what all of these assessments are, but why am I using them? So if we go to the next slide, the way we start to do this is to build a system. The way we start to help teachers and leaders understand is to build the system. Without a system for assessments, we fall into certain traps, like you see at the bottom of the slide, like having assessments, but just not using them, having too many assessments, not using the data in a timely fashion or at all. We give the assessments, but we either don't know how or don't have time or are unclear as to how to use that data to inform good instruction. So to build the system, we need to start to understand what questions do we have? What are we curious about? Are we curious about how the kids are doing? Are we curious about how teachers are teaching? Are we curious about where students are in their literacy growth and development? And once we figure out what questions we have, that will lead us to the data we need to answer those questions, and then the assessment that will get us that data. 
once we figured out the questions, know what data we need, we should start to map it. That will give teachers and our staff a clear, concise picture of what we have, what we're agreeing to use, when we use it, and how we use it. So one trick that, or strategy, I should say, not really a trick, but strategy that we have on the next two slides, but we can start with the next one, is to develop an assessment map. One way that I like to do that with staff is to start, like you see on the left, and list all the different types of assessments and what they are, just like you saw Robin do earlier, to make sure that if I know if I have these type assessments in my literacy curriculum or my lit literacy package, I have a well-rounded set of assessments that will give me the information we need, okay? So I'm very clear about the broad type that we have, the specific types, what is the purpose of them, how often we're going to give them. Sometimes I'll even put dates for my staff so that we know we're on a continuous cycle. And then I have us map what specifically are we using in our building, when, and then when are we going to have conversations about the data. So it helps map our team, whether that's a grade level or building level team, literacy conversations. On the next slide, you can quickly see just another example of how you can do this, not just for academics, but we do this for behavior, mental wellness, climate. Um, and I do this across grade levels because we don't always give the same assessment, right? So in this case, this is a, a larger district type mapping. And we were mapping, of course, across all areas, not just literacy. If we go to the next slide, please. So just for a moment in the chat, you've heard about literacy and making sure we're attending to all the components and how we might assess these components and in what ways. As you think about your district or your school or the literacy efforts you're leading, what is one of the biggest challenges that you're facing? Is it knowing even what assessments to use and when? Is it implementing those assessments well? because often we don't take the time to measure, are we implementing even the assessments with integrity? Are we managed, how are we managing the data collection and reporting? Especially to get data that is visible and usable, right, in a way that our staff can understand and make good decisions, or is it using the data to make instructional decisions? I'm gonna pop in the chat really quickly. What is the area that you're really struggling with? using data to make, absolutely. <laughs> I often have teachers tell me, um, I don't have time. I gave the assessment, but I don't have time to go back and reassess or understand or reteach the skill or fill in the blank, right? <laughs> As you're thinking about where you're struggling, and where you might have questions or, or opportunities to hear solutions from our panelists. We'll go to the next slide. We've talked a lot about the types of assessments um, and assessment data, uh, but there's a, there's a little more to it. So implementing the assessments on our map will tell us what's going on with the students. But it doesn't always tell us why or how. Right. For that, we might need to look at a broader scope of data. Fidelity, which we alluded to, which was the understanding of how we're delivering our instruction or our assessments. Maybe we need a deeper understanding of our coaching and professional learning data. Was professional learning delivered as it should have been in a way that was um, adherent to adult learning principles? How do we measure the adequacy of our resources or the capacity we have as a district or building to meet the needs of our staff? And how do we ensure that we have the right people? And by the right people, we mean the ones that are um, really involved in this type of instruction, getting the right data at the right time. Like Karen said in the chat, getting data that is useful and usable and having visuals to support meaning making. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth who will guide our panel. 
Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, <clears throat> I am thrilled to be able to introduce you to our amazing panelists here today, um, who are all experts, um, uh, who provided expertise and um, it did some implementation as well for um, the, the CMO pilot that, um, that a lot of our learnings have come from. Um, so today with me, well, joining me will be Genevieve Thomas of Spark Education, Tyler Porta, who is the Senior Data Analyst at Noble Schools, and Savon Tuckman of Datability. Oh, I forgot to put the little dash between data and ability. There should be a little dash there. Sorry about that. Uh, so for the pilot, um, Genevieve was um, provided literacy expertise to the entire network of schools. Um, she also facilitated the specific PLC um, of three CMOs who were very focused on literacy during the during the pilot, um, and so uh, she led that um, and worked very closely with especially those those three CMOs. Um, Tyler, uh, in his role at Noble Schools, was the data lead for Noble Schools implementation team. Um, he joined, I think after the first year. Um, so he'll, I'm sure he'll be able to, I've, I've loved hearing Tyler's stories about uh, um, what he did to kind of um, on board, help on board himself and, and figure out how to best support that team. And then Savan came on, I think also about halfway through the pilot to provide some really focused data and measurement expertise to um, directly to each CMO to really help focus um, that, um, their efforts and really understand the data that they were collecting. So we thought um, we'd kind of give you all of those perspectives today. So I think Cameron, if you want to go ahead and um, take the slide off so uh, <laughs> people can look at the folks who are talking. Uh, thank you. Um, and then my role just very briefly um, for the pilot was to uh, serve at the, at the evaluation um, support for the pilot, the research partner, um, but I also did um, support some of the CMOs um, with some of their data use as well. Um, but in my role of, uh, of an, as an evaluator, I did have the opportunity to talk um, with Tyler uh, several times about his experiences. And so um, I was like, I think his insights for this panel would be fantastic. <laughs> um, so what I also wanna just mention is just why were there three CMOs out of 10? Um, what was unusual about our network is that the, the CMOs did get to choose their own uh, specific problem and practice to work on. Um, sorry if there's background noise, hopefully Zoom is cleaning that out. Um, so there were, you know, depending on what was kind of considered most critical for their students with disabilities in each network, uh, the CMOs got to choose um, what to what to really specifically work on. So N Noble was one of the three schools that was really focused on improving the reading literacy of their students. And um, something else to also be aware of is that the uh, all the focal schools in the pilot happen to be middle and high schools. So um, sometimes the you know guidance around re improving reading will really differ for elementary and um, secondary level schools. Um, but our experts are very knowledgeable on um, the, the needs of uh, students at both of those levels. And I'm sure that if Tyler had elementary schools in his network, he would provide perfectly wonderful uh, data support for those schools as well. Um, so what I wanna just jump into, um, Genevieve having been longest with the pilot and being really focused on improving, helping those uh, CMOs in your PLC focus, um, we focus on literacy. If you can share with us um, a little bit about the work you did specifically with those with those CMOs and what you saw as their needs when it came to, especially when it came to using reading assessments and reading data. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here this afternoon. So as Elizabeth, Elizabeth said, I was the, the literacy content area expert for the CMO. So that was primarily facilitating the professional learning community, which was really focused on, um, you know, the National Reading Panel report that Robin shared about earlier is 
um, great and prolific and has a huge impact on the way that reading instruction happens in U.S. schools, but really focused on studies in the K-3 setting. Um, and since that time, we've learned a lot about best practices for uh, older non-proficient readers. And so the PLC was really focused around understanding what we know from the research about supporting the needs of, of older non-proficient readers with disabilities and how do we close that research to practice gap. Um, and then a lot of technical assistance as well and strategic coaching and some sort of traditional professional development as well. Um, and so in terms of assessment needs for the three CMOs that I was working most closely with, it, it was really different for each organization. So you know, one organization really didn't have a screening measure in place yet. And so we were thinking about kind of getting that up and off the ground and everything that needed to happen with that. Another CMO had a screening tool in place, but really didn't have diagnostic processes. So they had a good way to know which of their students were non-proficient readers. But what we know is that adolescent non-proficient readers really are a very heterogeneous group. And there's myriad reasons why students aren't reading proficiently, and they didn't have great systems for figuring figuring out why, and then targeting intervention. Um, and then the third CMO was building a new uh, reading intervention structure um, and really needed to think about progress monitoring and database decision-making rules and criteria. Um, so those were some of the things we were focused on. <clears throat> That's great. And so you certainly had your work cut out for you, and I'm guessing you're glad you didn't have 10 CMOs in your PLC. <laughs> um, so you talked a little bit about just um, having that data and um, you know thinking about how they were going to be using it as something that um, some of them were needed to be working on. Tyler, I'd like you to share a little bit about your experience coming into Noble, and you know I know that you joined that implementation team when they'd already they were already working together, and you were kind of um, learning and listening and trying to figure out what their needs were. Can you say a little bit about what you saw and, and then what how you kind of responded to, to, fill it, to filling those data needs? Yeah, definitely. Um, so before I just start talking, I, I do want to say that Noble is pretty more unique and their data infrastructure. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a full team of four data analysts and then two software engineers who do stuff for me like automations. Um, so it's just a little bit more things we're able to do. Uh, so when I came in onto the improvement team, um, I took all this with my director who left previously. And some things that she started off and some things that I continue to see uh, that I built off of was there was already a plan for um, using a 2000 to do screenings and then knowing um, the team knowing what data that they wanted to see and also had a plan to collect that data. Um, not so much a plan for how do we then report that data out easily? What do we then do with that data that we collect? And that is something that I took on. That's something that I then took on. Um, so uh, something that we have access to at Noble is Tableau. So I put together a Tableau data dashboard. So you can think about like something like Excel, but a little bit fancier. Um, and um, the dashboard would refresh every day. Um, so all of our leaders were able to get daily updates of where we were at with our aim statement, um, how we were doing with our fidelity of completing the screeners, because if we don't know where our students are, then we don't know if we group. And then also um, fidelity with um, um, completing the action items that we said would lead us to our goals. Um, so for us, that would be the two three thousand activities, and also adding the ability to segment that data by teacher and other demographics. I think that was the one of the more, not more important parts, but something that was key and and our success and how we thought about data as well. That's great. And so, um, uh, what would you just say? You saw changing then as a result of people having access to that, you know, that daily refresh, the ability to segment. What did you notice about the way the improvement team and others in the system started to actually use and interact with that with that data? I think I think a big part of this is when you have something just refreshing every day, it takes a a load off of um, our administrators and our teachers. 
um, say, downloading that data, putting it into a spreadsheet, then trying to figure out how to then make a pivot table and then make that pivot table. Um, all of the math are the things that I already did. Um, so it got folks to move into um, informing and changing practice a lot quicker and you know asking questions and finding answers a lot quicker as well. Um, so for us and our team meetings, we were able to really focus in on, hey, these are the questions that we laid out months ago. Where are we at with them? And then also just the nature of the way the dashboard is set up, very quickly able to segment any data point by teacher. Um, be like, hey, well, these teachers are going, um, we see massive growth with these teachers. Let's go in their classroom. Let's see what they're up to. Let's see what they're doing. And let's see what we can mimic. Um, we have two focal campuses. Let's see if we can mimic it at, at our other school and our or with our other teachers in the same school. So it was really um, beneficial in the sense of how can we find where we're doing well and take that and expand it. That's great. So not not just where where it's not working, but where is it really working and being able to to zero in on that and 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 quickly and see what was going on in practice. Correct. Yes. Um, and I'll say to Savan and Genevieve, um, you know, most of these CMOs had the reason they were in this network is because they had established a history and culture of strong data practice. But then sometimes when it comes to specifically meeting the needs of students with disabilities. Um, we can see challenges and gaps in the use of data. Can you talk a little bit about where where you saw gaps in their use of data um, or access to data um, for to to specifically meet those students those students needs and and how did you advise them when it came to you know date reading practice or instruction practice and or the 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 data and measurement practice? Devon, if you want to start, yeah. um, I think like Genevieve mentioned. Uh, each CMO was at a different place um, with their their data practices. And, um, you know, there were some CMOs that had lots of data. They were collecting lots of data, but they weren't necessarily using lots of data to inform their instruction on a regular basis. And part of that was because of some of those data systems. Um, so if you are um, really only doing a fall and a spring um uh, assessment of students, it's really hard to progress monitor. It's really hard to know whether you're you're making the progress and the changes that you need to in your instruction um, to support students. So um, having to work with schools on really thinking um, about whether they had tools already in place, whether they were collecting data in other ways um, that could inform their instruction. And then I think, as we've mentioned, time being of the essence, how do you find um, easy ways to integrate in um, through whether you have instructional coaching or um, grade level team meetings um, so that teachers are given that time to actually be able to review data, um, learn how to do that, um, and then also um, work together on thinking strategically about how they're making changes to their instructional practices. Um, and I think for every CMO, that was a journey they were on. Um, and, you know, they all had to make um, that those changes um, in different paces based on what was going on in their local context. That's that's really, really interesting that, you know, it's it's that middle of that middle time that it gets challenging. Genevieve, did, did you have any insights about what? recommendations you would make to schools and districts about making sure you can have that kind of comprehensive, reliable data besides the beginning of the year, end of the year? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, thinking about specifically our target population that we were working to address the needs of with the, the NIC, which was our students with disabilities, specifically our Black and Latinx students with disabilities experiencing poverty. Um, I mean, you're exactly right, Elizabeth. All of the CMOs we were working with had strong data practices in place. And what that often looked like was using, for example, common formative assessments for kind of your grade level differentiation, which is so important. We absolutely want our schools doing that. 
And some of our students with disabilities, not all of them, but some of them are reading very far below grade level. So in addition to thinking about how do we meet the needs of those students with rigorous grade level expectations and academic content, we also need to be thinking about how do we really in an accelerated way, close up those learning gaps. Um, and that's where we had to do a, a lot of work around the assessment piece, right? So it's not enough just to know which of our students are not reading proficiently, but then how do we figure out what exactly the issue is so that we can have not a one size fits all reading intervention, but really targeted intervention, the type of targeted intervention that's gonna be more, more accelerative. Um, and then to your question about progress monitoring, once we have that in place, we also want to be sure that we're not just, you know, at the beginning of the year, if you're below grade level, you go into the intervention class and then you're there all year, right? Like the goal is that we're closing up those gaps quickly, or if we're not, that we're engaged in those continual discussions and database decisions so that we can intensify instruction. Um, but I think, you know, an important point, I'm seeing some comments come up in the chat is is the whole idea behind this model and this screening and progress monitoring and the metaphor that Sophia shared earlier is that you know our screening processes should be really efficient. And if we're using good assessments, they're valid and reliable. So they are really truly predicting reading proficiency and reading risk so that that more time intensive diagnostic assessment and progress monitoring, we're not doing that with every kid. We're really doing that more intensive um, assessment and database decision making with those students who truly need that level and we're being as efficient as possible with screening and core tier one practices. <clears throat> so Tyler, I was curious if um, if the, you know, based on what Genevieve was just recommending and based on your ability to put better data in people's hands really in a timely way, has there been a more demand for you on on these data are you are you building are you needing to then build out your system um for for, for supporting that progress monitoring um uh you know in this in this timely way just curious at how it's affecting um how how what you built is affecting <laughs> uh what you have what you're now having to continue to build out um, I would say yes, but more on say the the tier one level, right? Um, and that well, by that I mean that I I think over the last two two or three years, um, this idea of focusing on literacy, one also at our high school level, has became more apparent. Um, I think that when we started four years ago now, when we started the pilot, we did not expect for um, the results of screeners and tests to come in as low as they did. Um, and that was very eye-opening. Um, and even anal in different analysis of the projects that I've worked on, we started adding Lexout as something to consider, um, say in our, our MTSS process. And then for this, what I call suite of data tools that I develop, again, primarily on Tableau. Um, so in addition to what we have access to on Star Reading, um, all of our administrators and teachers they have access to are able to um, um, view their Lexile scores and then see their Lexile scores, see, see the Lexile scores of students that they teach in comparison to um, campuses across our network, across the district, and then also um, compared to other teachers in their school as well. And the whole idea of this, right, is to um, benchmark and help people see like, okay, you're working, I see that you're working well, or whatever you're doing is working well with your students with IEPs. Let me observe you, what's up, what's happening, right? Um, and the same idea with our campuses, if a, a dean of instruction see that another campus is particularly doing well in reaching um, growth with students, um, they're able to connect and reach out. And then for professional learning, I did four sessions last school year, and I have one coming up next week um, about literacy and literacy data and the tools that I developed for folks and also how we can then use what Star Reading, something that we're already paying for, <laughs> what Star Reading has available as well. So it has 
um, increase in awareness and interest um, in looking at that data and and then that informing and changing practice part. Now, how can I now use this to change what, what's going on in our classrooms? That's great. Genevieve and Savan, I'm curious what other changes you saw uh, across the, in the CMOs that you worked with about um, how they were using, thinking about and using radius reading assessments and, and focus, using their data differently by the end of the pilot. I'll jump in. Um, I'm sure uh, Genevieve will have a little bit to add to this because part of um, the data that I really saw grow in um, a couple of the CMOs was as a result of the work they were doing with Genevieve on oral reading fluency practice. Um, and so I worked with them on how to keep track of the data they were collecting um, as they were working with students on um, oral reading fluency. Um, I apologize for the active cat. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I similar um, but less complex maybe than um, Tyler in Tableau was uh, working with um, the schools in, you know, very simple Excel spreadsheets um, that would automate some of their data collection and help them graph um, student progress. Um, but I think one of the biggest things was even just them um, seeing how often they were even doing the practice was sometimes very important. Um, keeping like that for, for researchers, we think of it as just implementation um, and just seeing that they were implementing on a regular basis their reading practices and that they were um, also seeing um, benefits for students. Great. Genevieve, think changes that you saw? Over yeah. Time? Give an example, since I've been speaking a little bit about that uh, diagnostic process. So one CMO, um, again, at the start, already had a screener in place and had kind of a, had one reading intervention available for students, which was great that that was available, but it wasn't meeting the needs of all students. Um, and so we developed a multiple gating process where we were then using, still using that screener, right? And then, but setting cutoff points and students falling below those, those cutoff points, we were using additional assessments to figure out, okay, who are our kids who are fluent readers, but really have, you know, vocabulary comprehension needs? Those kids need a different intervention than our kids who are scoring low on the, the screener because they're not fluent readers. Those kids really need a reading fluency intervention. Um, and those are different from our kids who aren't reading fluently because they don't have intact phonics skills yet. And those students need a really intensive phonics focused intervention. Um, so we were able to first, even though we started kind of thinking at the assessment level and the database decision making level, what that did once we had the data was really inform what actual intervention looked like as well. That's great. Um, I'm going to check in uh, before we wrap up our panel and see if, um, Jill, do we have any burning questions uh, from from our attendees? I uh, will remind folks, we'll have breakout sessions, and so you can uh, jump into a breakout right at the, around the top of the hour, um, but we have a time for maybe one or two questions. Yeah, great. Um, well, I think Genevieve uh, addressed the one that has... Um has come out, which is if anyone has a simple method to help teachers with, you know, very overcrowded classrooms, say they have 150 students um, to assess reading abilities. So she talked about sort of the efficiency, um, those initial assessments, but if anyone else has thoughts there, it'd be great. The one other thing I would add to that, Jill, is just, you know, when we're talking about this type of assessment system, we're talking about systems. It's system level work. So an individual teacher in her classroom is not going to be able to do all of this work. But the more that we can think about this as a systematic process that happens in our school system, um, the more, I think, again, efficiencies and the more realistic it is to, to do the kind of work we're talking about today. And so we will have some breakouts in a moment, but I do want to give our panelists just one chance to give a final um, a final key recommendation. So like, you know, key takeaway, if there's one thing that attendees, you'd want them to really, really take home from based on your experience in the pilot, based on what we've, we've talked about today, uh, what would that be? And uh, let's start, let's start with Tyler. Um. I, 
one thing I have for me is data and data tools are only they're they're as valuable as they are used in practice or how 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 do we incorporate them to inform our practice? Um, something Savan mentioned earlier is that there were some, as I'm sure one of us was us, um, being the there's there were some boards who had a lot of data, collected so much data and just didn't use it, whether that be just capacity, time, or or know-how, right? Um, but data only has it has as much value as the use of it. Thanks. Genevieve, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, a couple of folks today, Tyler and somebody else earlier, talked about this idea of asking questions and starting from the place of asking questions before we're choosing tools and creating decision-making criteria. And I just really echo that and, and encourage people to think about this as it's a continuous improvement process. That's the work we were doing in the NIC. That's the work we're all doing in schools every day. There's no done. There's no there. It's really just about asking questions about what's happening in our system what's working well, where is it not working well, for what students is it not working well, and then how do we continue to get better every day? Um, and the work never ends, my friends, but it's really about asking those questions and engaging in the work of continual improvement. Yvonne, last word. Um, and I'm going to build off of, I think, um, Tyler and just say, look at the systems you already have in place. Um, to find opportunities for um, giving educators the space to use data. Um, if you put it on them and just say, integrate this into your lesson planning, um, it's very unlikely to happen. And it's not out of a lack of will, it's out of a lack of priority, like the ability to prioritize what is um, of most importance. Um, and I think um, most of us who have been educators, we know that like we deal with what's on the ground in that moment um, and data often will take a back seat unless as a school leader, you're able to um, devote and prioritize time um, in professional development, in um, teacher meetings, et cetera. Um, and as I mentioned in coaching to really actually allow for the use of data for informing instruction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, panelists. Uh, really appreciate you and the work you contributed, sharing your expertise with us today. I miss working with you all. Um, but uh, folks can join you in the breakouts, which Jay is going to come back on and tell us a little bit about. Yeah. Oops, excuse me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for the, the panelists, the presenters. I mean, this was wonderful. There's a lot of expertise in the room. And so to be able to balance, like, the time of our attendees and our experts in the room, um, we do have um, each of the experts will be having a breakout session so that you can have um, smaller group time to really have a conversation with them. So we really do hope you're able to stay and have those conversations. So we'll talk about those in a second. For those that have to run and are just staying a few minutes after the hour, we will be sending out the PowerPoint and the webinar. We're gonna add into the PowerPoint the um, contact information for all the panelists and the presenters. So you'll have that um, if you want to follow up with them um, in that way. So just again, thank you for attending. And now for the folks who are able to stay and have those deeper dive conversations, on the next slide, we um, we list what the, or on the next slide after that one, sorry. Here's the, the titles of the breakout rooms. I'm just gonna ask um, the expert to kind of just say a sentence or two about what they're going to talk about. And then we'll open up the breakout rooms and you can, as an attendee, you can choose where you want to go. So Genevieve, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, well, I'm happy to talk about whatever people want to talk about. But our initial plan for my breakout was um, considerations, uh, particularly around like technical adequacy, that sort of thing, um, when selecting assessments for uh, the different purposes within your system. And so, Sophia? Yes, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about assessment mapping, feel free to join me. Um, you still will get the resources of the assessment maps. Uh, but if you want to learn a little bit more, please join me in the room. <laughs> and, and Savannah? 
yeah, I'll be talking about um, trying to use what you already have in place and um, reducing some of the burden um, that can often be felt in the data collection um, and, and use of data um, in regular practice. And Tyler. And then for me, I'm thinking more about the data reporting. Um, so what are some technical systems that can be developed? And by technical, I'm thinking, I talk about Tableau, but also Excel, also other Google Sheets and other things that just folks just have access to right now. And so that's the piece, just reporting. And then using that reporting to do something. Thank you all. So as Genevieve said, you can ask other questions. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, right. If you have questions specific to each of the folks, but these are these are the topics that um, you, they would otherwise be focusing on. And also just to let you know, as the breakout rooms are being um, opened, hopefully um, we're not going to come back together as a large group. We just want you to have the conversation that you need to have in your breakout room. And then when that conversation is over, you all um, just again, thank you for coming. And we will be in touch through email with the resources. So Cameron, do you want to talk us through the breakout rooms? Yes, so I'm about to open breakout rooms. Um, so you should see that pop up on your screen. If you do not check the Zoom toolbar or the more options on the Zoom toolbar uh, to be able to bring up the breakouts and self-select. And the, the, the number on that left of the slide is in that row is the number of the breakout rooms. So Genevieve is one, Sophia two, Savan three, and Tyler four. Thank you. All right, everyone.